Welcome to the BC Search and Rescue Association's AdventureSmart Expert Webinar Series. Tonight, it's veterinarian professional Celine Ritz from Bark First Aid and emergency preparedness trainer Scott Montague. <laughs> We start off tonight with our first guest. Scott Montague is a volunteer emergency preparedness trainer with the North Shore and Coquitlam, the creator of the Youth Emergency Preparedness Program, and has been featured as a presenter at the Provincial Emergency Preparedness and Business Continuity Conference. He's also a resource member with Coquitlam Search and Rescue. He has a few hats, I think. And he's an Adventure Smart volunteer educator. And the producer of our webinar series. We can't really live without Scott, to be honest. And all of that in addition to his full-time job in IT. Most weekends, though, you'll find Scott balancing out that busy schedule, camping somewhere off the forest road, so anywhere in BC or Washington State, so that he can enjoy epic adventures, snowshoeing, Nordic skiing, microspiking, or hiking along with his wife and their beautiful dog. Welcome, Scott. Thank you kindly. Uh, I, I'm anxious to get to Celine uh, tonight as well. So I'm just going to jump right into this. Second here. Bingo. Just wanted to start off by saying that I'm fortunate enough to live and work in Port Moody which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. That includes the Salwatooth, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Coquitlam in this area. And very happy to be with you tonight. So we're gonna go through three steps for personal preparedness. We want you to know your hazards, make your plan, gather your supplies. You'll hear that a few times. That first step, know your hazards. What hazards you have depend on where you live in the province. They actually even depend on where you live on a particular street. These are the top 10 hazards in BC. Uh, we know floods have consistently been at the top of the list of the most costly disasters in BC, though of course wildfires, COVID-19 and other disasters have been vying for that top space as of late. Uh, and of course, much of the population lives in an area that could be affected by a big earthquake. And if that were to happen, we would probably have the most costly disaster in BC. Once you know what hazards are likely to affect you where you live, it's the best to make a plan that takes into account those hazards as well as the personal considerations of your household. The way I like to do it is sort of break it down into two categories. There's a type of hazard where it's best to hunker down at home. These are large regional events where there's no ability to evacuate people to a safe place. You're going to need to be able to be to tough it at, out at home for up to two weeks. That means you need to have a plan to uh, get home in the first place. Like, what if you're at school or at work and you need to be able to communicate amongst your family uh, when they aren't at home? How do you get home when the bridges are closed, the roads are destroyed? And also you need a backup plan in case you can't get home. Uh, what if we can't get to home? Well, you know what? Let's all meet at Aunt Betty's uh, who is 20 minutes away. And everyone needs to know that in advance because the communication system might be down at that time. Once you're finally at home, you need to uh, have a way of communicating to the rest of the world and letting them know you're safe because there might be a person in Ottawa or a person in India who's looking after you and who's desperate to hear because all they hear is what's happening in the media. So you want to have that communication plan in place beforehand so that you know exactly how to communicate with them and they know where to look for the updates. And of course, you're going to need to have supplies to keep everyone fed, watered, clean and healthy for up to two weeks. Again, two weeks with no power, no water, 
And of course, that means no toilet. Uh, no heat, no stove, no ability to go to the stores. You can't go to the gas stations because they're closed. The pharmacies aren't open. And again, that's going to be up for two weeks, taking into account the special needs of everyone in your household. Prepared BC has lots of resources for how to build a plan and make a kit for emergencies where you need to ride it out at home. But today we're going to do a deeper dive into the other types of emergencies, which are the ones where you need to be ready to evacuate. Case of emergencies like floods, wildfires, structure fires, tsunamis, landslides, and avalanches, it's likely going to be safer to leave your home. Now you'll notice I had hazardous material spills there as well. Those ones are tricky. Sometimes it's you've got warning and people tell you it's time to evacuate. Other times you may not have any warning and it might be safer to stay in the house with all your doors and windows closed, all the fans off, sealed in a room until a cloud of poisonous gas passes by. So that's where it's really important to have a radio in your systems and in your house so that you can listen to emergency messages from officials. In some cases, you might get an emergency uh, alert an evacuation alert that gives you a few hours to gather your supplies. In other situations, your first warning may be the knock of a fireman telling you you have to leave now and escorting you out. For those emergencies, you got to be ready to grab and go. So the next step in getting ready is to gather your supplies. Now that you know what you're planning for and you've made a plan, what are those supplies so that you can actually manage the emergency. We're not going to touch on the home kit today, uh, but I encourage you to go to preparedbc.ca to get a checklist of all the things that you're going to need to be able to survive at home for two weeks with no services. Today, we're going to be focusing in on evacuations. The idea is to put together something fully pre-packed so you can easily grab it on your way out in an emergency. Backpacks are perfect for this kind of kit because it keeps your hands free to do other things like grab your dog or help your daughter. Remember, you're never going to actually be in, uh, evacuated to a raft in the middle of an ocean. You're more likely to be evacuated to a place with restaurants and a Walmart. This kind of bag is designed to get you through that first day while you try to evaluate what you need to replace. That said, some things are harder to get. So you're going to need things like a spare pair of glasses in the bag because it takes a long time to get a prescription done. And you're going to need to have medications, at least a week's worth of medications. That gives you time to find a place that you're going to stay for the next few, few days. Uh, and then it gives you time to go to a doctor, get a prescription, go to a new pharmacy, get that prescription filled, and you're still be going to have a couple days left in case there's any problems. Really important to have those medications that will last you a week in your grab and go bag. And of course, keep them fresh. If you're lucky enough, of course, you'll have more time to evacuate. Yay! Uh, but you still want to have this kit anyway. There's been lots of examples. There was some out of uh, Fort Mac where a person went and grabbed a trophy from when he was a kid and he put it in his, uh, his uh, uh, stuff to go evacuate with and failed to bring other really basic things like a, uh, uh, copies of his insurance papers. By having your grab and go kit all set up, you're good to go. And actually, when you're looking at it here, I'm just looking at over here on the thing, you'll notice a lot of those items are actually items that are in your backcountry kit. They're the essentials that we talk about in Adventure Smart. And if you want, you can actually just use a single pack as your grab and go kit and as your day pack. That's what I do. So I have a pack that is has all the grab and go supplies in it. And some of the stuff that I don't need when I'm hiking, I actually have in a little baggie that sort of stays at the top of the pack. And I, when I get to the trailhead, I remove that baggie and I put it in the trunk. And then maybe I want to have like, I don't know, spare toque or something like that. And I put it in the backpack. And then I carry my day pack and off I go. Come back to the car, take out the stuff that was just for that particular trip, put the baggie back in, that's my grab and go kit. 
what works for you is going to be different than what works for me. But you have to remember that everyone in your household should have a grab-and-go kit. That's including folks who are elderly, your four-year-old, and even your infant and your pets. Now, how that's going to work, obviously your infant's not going to be able to take a backpack. Maybe your four-year-old might be fussy over it too. You might need to have something more like a, a carry-on bag with a rolly uh, bottom. That might make it easier for your four-year-old to carry it with her. What's going to work for you is going to be different than what's going to work for me. But if you plan it out in advance, you can even run a test and see if it works. I'm not going to get into pets too much because Celine's going to be talking about evacuating with pets. But remember that everyone, including your pets, should be ready to go at a moment's notice. The key thing is you need to start preparing today before the emergency happens. Once the emergency is happening, you're too busy to try and remember to do everything right. So take the time now, gather the supplies, have a plan, discuss it with everyone in your family, and maybe even test it every now and then. And that way, when an emergency happens, you will be much, much less stressed. You need to learn what hazards are, avail uh, are applicable to you in your area. You need to make a hunker down at home plan and an evacuation plan. You need to gather your supplies for hunkering down at home and evacuating. Good news is, this was quick. PreparedBC.ca has lots more information. They have guides for each of the different hazards that you might want to encounter. They have a household emergency plan. They have a fill-in-the-blank plan. Lots of good stuff that you can go in, use checklists, the whole shebang. Check it out, PreparedBC.ca. And I'm going to take questions from you at the end after we're done with Celine. But for now, I'm going to hand things back to Sandra. Sandra. Thank you, Scott. That was great. It's really helpful for those of us who are getting reminders with that information or those of us who are being introduced to that information. If you were in the chat during Scott's presentation, you could see there was a link provided for the prepared BC grab and go. It's a great resource. Scott just went over it beautifully. Thank you. Uh, yet you can go to and should go to the link to really jump into and pick out all those finer details that he brought to our attention, introduced us or reminded us all about. So Scott, looks like you got a, quite a few thumbs up there. So I think we're on the right track this evening with our emergency preparedness webinar this evening. As we move through and welcome our next guest, I'd like to introduce Celine. Celine Ritz is a veterinarian professional a certified pet first aid instructor and owner of Backcountry Aid and Rescue Kit, BARK. That couldn't be a better acronym, actually. She provides pet, for, uh, sorry, she provides pet first aid and training and pet first aid kits designed to withstand the rigorous of a season in the bush. So Lynn has worked in the bush and is a tree planter for over a decade. Also, she has fulfilled roles as foreman, quality checker, an occupational health and safety advisor. Celine lives in beautiful Revelstoke, BC, with her dog Fella and cat Skip Tooth. She is a dog sled musher and a volunteer ski patroller at Revelstoke Mountain Resort. Celine also wears many hats, and I'd like to invite her to turn her camera on and join us on the screen tonight. We look forward to your presentation. This is the second time Celine's joined us. She came on earlier and talked about doggy first aid. If you haven't seen that webinar, I'll show you where that is later on. Celine, welcome, and thanks thank for coming you. back. Thank you guys so much. Um, big thumbs up. It was uh, good to see all the hearts and the shocked faces at first. So it's definitely an engaged group. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to sharing what I know about pet safety with everyone. So just want to make sure here, Sandra and Scott, can you guys please just let me know that this looks good for you? Maybe a thumbs up or a All heart. All good. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Celine Ritz. I am the owner of Bark First Aid and I am located in Revelstoke. Um, which is on the traditional lands of the Shequetmik, the Silks, the Sinaiaks, and the Tanaha. This is a really beautiful photo here um, of a Sinaiaks family on a sturgeon nose canoe on, uh, in the Sinaiaks language, Sinwin to Kwekku, which is Swift River in Sinaiaks and what we currently know as uh, the Columbia Headwaters. 
I just wanted to start this presentation here with uh, a pretty profound visual. Uh, this is from the Lytton fires. Uh, a few years ago, we can all remember just how devastating those were. Um, especially for the animals that were left behind. This particular evacuation was very sudden um, and it did catch quite a lot of people off guard. And for a lot of people, they weren't actually able to go home um, to retrieve their animals. So many animals were left behind. So I do just want to acknowledge um, with the visual of this picture, just how profound these emergencies are and how impactful they are for our pets. Um, but also just a big thanks to the emergency responders, the paramedics, the firefighters, SBCA, all the people that come together to care for our pets uh, in these times. So our animals are dependent on us to survive when disasters strike. And a good thing to remember during a disaster, what's good for you is also good for your pets. So I'd like everyone who's on the call right now uh, I don't know if you can do like the dog emoji, but just take a moment now uh, to consider who you're planning for. That's my dog, Fella, right there. He's actually sleeping at my feet. And I sincerely want to do everything I can to keep him safe in an emergency. So a couple big stats here. What we know, during the 2023 wildfire season, over 200,000 Canadians were under an evacuation notice. That's a lot of Canadians. And because such a large proportion of Canadian households own pets, really ranges depending on where you're sourcing your information, but it's about 70% of Canadian households. Uh, so even a small effect of pet ownership has a pretty significant impact in disasters. Unfortunately, what we have observed uh, through trial and error that the general pet owning public uh, has some notable gaps in disaster risk awareness knowledge and planning that is necessary for emergency preparedness with their animals. And this is kind of a scary topic, but what we can expect in the coming decades, uh, just that climate change is going to become more frequent, uh, intense and more diverse extreme weather events. And these impacts will continue to affect us and our animals. So we just really need to take the time now uh, to start a great foundation in our awareness of our risk poten potential of an evacuation and what we can do about it. So as Scott said, long range planning starts with familiarizing yourself with the potential types of natural disasters in your area and prepare uh, with your pet for each one. I uh, piggyback off, off that image there, but what sort of supplies are we gonna take for an evacuation? Well, we want at least two, work, two weeks worth of supplies after a cataclysmic event. I'm a bit of an over planner, so I tend to overpack, um, but we really don't want to be short on items that are essential during an evacuation. Before we have to evacuate, highly recommend keeping all, all your supplies organized and ready to go. I like taking pictures of all the supplies laid out before I put them in the bags so that I have a quick reference to, rep to look at um, in the event that I need to grab everything quickly. If we're storing food and water, uh, make sure that we're rotating it every three months just so that we have, um, make sure that it's fresh. All right, so this is the inside of my mind, also my evacuation kit for all the things I think I'm going to need um, for my animals specifically. So I have a couple of things here for myself, but our conversation today is about the pets. So lots of backpacks, lots of bags, just to have all sorts of opportunities to carry things some comfortable bedding, food, treats, some enrichment toys. Um, you'll see here in the Yeti bag, I have a pet first aid kit, a pet safety field guide, some deodorizing spray, cause that can really come in handy. And that funny looking blue thing is actually one of those uh, like card detailing uh, brush as little gloves. Those are actually really great dog towels in a pinch and they're really fun to play with for your dog. So it is kind of a double header, but ideally, like Scott said, we wanna have everything organized in one bag that we know we just have to grab and go. For some long range planning, um, a really interesting stat, owning pets appears to be the most significant reason why Canadian households fail to evacuate when they've been told to do so. So by incorporating our animals in our evacuation planning, you can mitigate pet evacuation failure and improve our animals' survival prognosis during a natural disaster. 
So your animal really depends on you and your actions and what you're going to, how you're going to plan everything well before the emergency to ensure that they also escape or evacuate with you. So these are some pretty striking photos of, of an in emergency moment. Um, and really when we want to think about what we're doing in these moments, it, we have to take a step back and consider how are we planning for this? Trying to create a plan during an emergency will result in less than ideal outcomes. So we're planning right now. And starting with your community, your community is invaluable during the times of an emergency. So consider that many people or yourself might not be home when an evacuation order is implemented. So exchange numbers and emergency plans with your neighbors and close friends in the event that you're not home to retrieve your pets. Create a community plan, including key staging areas to facilitate evacuation for everyone. So this is an example of a floor plan. This is my house, this is how to get in, and this is how to get out. This is something I've roughly drawn up. Um, you can see that little red uh, icon there is where I'm located in Revelstoke. I've labeled it so that I have a few first aid, uh, some neighbors with first aid or uh, first responder skills, you know, doctor, um, first responder, that sort of thing. I've also put some labels on where I can fuel up, where the gas station is, where the hospital is, and also what my evacuation route is gonna be in every direction out of town. During an evacuation, you may have one uh, direction completely cut off. So consider what will my exit be to the east, the west, and to the south. And with those, also considering what my temporary address would be, where the nearest vet clinic might be, and any other you know, tidbits of information, where's the nearest gas station? Because that's important to know as well. I really just wanna start by emphasizing that evacuations are so stressful, um, but they're stressful for all of us. And to consider really what stress and anxiety does to our animals in these times. Pain and fear can make our animals act unpredictable or even dangerous. So consider that fear and anxiety that an animal goes through during an evacuation and just how dysregulating that can be. That's especially true for animals who are really into their routine, uh, don't usually have a ton of disruptions to their day to day, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, they're confined in a vehicle in a lot of very stressful, unusual places. This stress may also exacerbate medical conditions. For example, cats are prone to having urinary problems, which is related to stress. So something to consider if you're trying to convince your cat to use the litter box on the side of the highway. Another big thing, uh, desensitizing our pets to handling, to certain environments, to uh, sounds, the crate, anything that we could potentially get our pets familiar with. I see some thumbs up. I know you guys understand the value of that, but that just makes everything go by so much smoother. Um, so really consider right now while we're in our planning phase, start desensitizing our animals to potentially scary things within their threshold uh, so that it's really a reward thing for them. Identification. I'd love to see a thumbs up if you have a pet um, with a permanent ID, such as a tattoo or a microchip. During the times of evacuation, a collar can slip, they can slip out of a collar or have something fall off. So we really want to be sure that they have some form of permanent ID. As you can see in that photo, uh, there is a veterinarian scanning that dog for a microchip, which is like tiny little, like micro little grain uh, that's implanted between the shoulders. Another great option is even an air tag. Those are pretty cheap. I have lots on my keys, my wallet, my purse, and I've actually got one on my dog's collar as well. So considering once we've left our home, how are we transporting our pet? Really the safest thing to do is crate training them so that when we have them in a vehicle, they're comfortable and they feel safe in a crate. This is an even more complex situation with any sort of exotics uh, birds and reptiles, um, because their enclosures might be kind of big or maybe a bit unusual, like some fish or some amphibians. Talk to your veterinarian now or the next time you see them about travel anxiety supplements. There are some remedies to help with that, uh, such as prescription grade medication like gabapentin, trazodone. Um, there are pheromone sprays, CBD products, thunder shirts, 
and even calming food that will really help just take the edge off when you can. I'd love for you guys to do this now or tonight or first thing tomorrow morning, but do this as soon as you can. Register your pet with the BCSPCA. This will really save so much time to expedite any sort of uh, reunion with your pet if you have been separated. Next up, give your vet clinic a call, local animal welfare organization or the SPCA to see if they have a disaster plan and if that includes um, something that maybe you can glean some information off of. Make a list of the local animal resources in your area with some phone numbers and addresses and include that in your emergency preparedness first aid kit. For Bark, my company, I have some pet first aid and emergency preparedness kits, uh, one of which I've called the glove box kit. So stay informed. This is the day and age of instant information and during an emergency, that is so crucial. So we wanna stay informed of current conditions and know how we will receive emergency alerts and warnings. So there's a great app here, that evacuation notice, um, even for folks who have livestock or any um, uh, hobby farms, just to join Facebook groups like this BC and Alberta Emergency Livestock Evacuation Support Group. Stuff like that is so great to rally together as a community to help one another out. All right, so we're gonna practice. Practice makes perfect. We've all done fire drills. We've all done emergency preparedness plans. Let's do one with our pets. And one thing to consider, let's say if you have cats, um, consider where they might be hiding. Animals can really sense when something is about to happen, especially a natural disaster. So consider that they're gonna be hiding and they're not gonna wanna come out. Another idea is to actually practice an emergency response or an emergency evacuation drill at nighttime. Can look a little different, especially maybe if you're loading a trailer full of horses. Water, 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 water. I think this is the thing personally that I have seen most folks miss out or maybe um, kind of underestimate how much they need. For reference, uh, dogs can drink up to four liters. Cats can drink up, up to one liter a day. Um, and just something to consider that when we're evacuating, public water sources may be cut off or contaminated. So we really want to be sure that we have enough water um, to get through that time. Another great option is offering your pet canned food because there is a bit of moisture and water to that. So some crates and carriers. If you have a large breed dog, just consider that a dog must be able to stand up and turn around in their carrier um, in order for it to be big enough for them. Another option is to bring along a collapsible X-Pen or old tent even just for some more space. Uh, if you, let's say, are stopped on the side of the highway or at a gas station for one hour, um, just to give them a bit of space um, and still some privacy and comfort. A couple of things here to consider vaccines. I'd love to see a thumbs up if your pets are up to date on their vaccines. Maybe like a shocked face if you're not sure if they are or what sort of vaccines they need. Um, oh, I see one. Thanks for being honest. So wild and non-domesticated animals are often displaced during natural disaster, and there is an increased risk of exposure to diseased wildlife. Having up-to-date vaccines is also a matter of safety in confined temporary emergency housing with other animals because they may not be fully vaccinated, and that's a potential risk of transmission. Whatever medications and supplements your pet may need, as well as bulls, leashes, carriers, poop bags, the list goes on and on and on and on as well as digital copies of your vet records, especially if your pet has any prescriptions that you may need filled. So my cat is named Skip Tooth. He is uh, a bit of a wild animal, so he doesn't really love to come inside all too much. He's too busy hunting all of the vermin in Revelstoke. But if I was to transport him, I would definitely need to buy him a harness and a leash because I know if I needed to stop to let him out for some fresh air on the side of the highway, he'd be gone. So consider really just investing in a good harness, a high visibility leash, and lots of identification and tags for your cat, just because they're not usually out in places uh, where you may find yourself during an evacuation. Another thing that uh, can be a source of 
worry or anxiety for cats is a lot of change and even down to the change in kitty litter. So just be sure that if you are bringing along your, your cat, that you bring the kitty litter that they're familiar to, just because the fewer changes you introduce, the better. All right. And this is something that we can do tonight. I would love every single person on this call to take pictures of you with your pets. Take some selfies, sure, but take pictures of your pet with from both sides, front and overhead for rapid identification. You can see this dog here. Uh, her name is Mezcal. She's got some pretty unique patterning to her coat. Um, if you can imagine, let's say, a bunch of black cats that have been surrendered during an evacuation or found by emergency personnel, it might be really hard to identify your pet if they look kind of like everybody else. So try to take some pictures, especially if you have any specific traits, maybe some coloring of their gums um, or some spots. Consider reaching out to another vet clinic, uh, prepare kennels or crates with clean bedding, maybe some uh, puppy pads. And even one step further, have your vehicle ready to go. I think that was uh, one big lesson that I learned uh, during the fires around the East Kootenays a few years ago when we were evacuating livestock. Um, quite a few vehicles on the farm or on someone's property had a slow leak in the tire or was low on gas or is kind of finicky and only one person knows how to drive it. So make sure that your vehicles are safe and ready to go. Your keys are in an obvious place and they have a full tank of gas. I even like to bring along an extra jerry can um, just to be safe. Um, so here's some, uh, one quite sad photo of this dog here, but these are some photos of what it looks like when a pet has been left behind. This dog on the left with those burns was actually left behind during a wildfire in the South Okanagan. Uh, their owners just did not have time to come back to the farm to gather the dog. The dog was free roaming on the property and emergency uh, personnel were able to get this dog after a few days. Um, in that time, it had sustained some pretty significant burns from the fire. Also here again, rescue personnel, firefighters, you guys are really the true hero. Maybe a thumbs up or a heart if you are a rescue personnel or perhaps have had a good experience with one, they really need to know just how much we appreciate their efforts in times like this. So what does it look like if you leave without your animal? It's the worst thought to consider, but it's really something we have to really keep in mind. So reuniting with your animal if you had to leave them behind can be super complicated. Uh, speaking from experience, uh, the task is much easier if you take these planning steps in advance. After a disaster, this is how it kind of works out. A disaster agency like the SPCA um, will ask to have your address and description of the animals left behind. The pets will be taken from your home and held in a temporary facility um, until they can be formally identified by the owner. So what does that look like? Records and identification, like the vet clinic records we talked about, are required to assure ownership. Also, by preparing a pet rescue card, rescue personnel can quickly and effectively retrieve your animal once it's safe to do so. And I'll show you what that looks like soon. If you are unable to locate your pet, let's say it's a cat that's an indoor outdoor cat, ensure at least there's, uh, there is at least one week's worth of food and water in several locations throughout the house or consider an auto feeder. Those things are great and they actually do work when there's a power outage. Arrange a safe room at your home for your pets that is clear of hazards such as tools, debris or toxic products and keep the toilet seats up. You never know just how valuable that, that little bit of water may be. So here is a QR code if you wanted to whip your phone out and take a picture and, and be brought to my website, Bark First Aid, <clears throat> excuse me, Bark First Aid. But this is a um, evacuation card. So this is what's meant to be printed on your door, maybe laminated even, that is for rescue personnel to see how many dogs, how many cats, and potentially how many flying squirrels or exotics? Maybe thumbs up. Does anyone have any exotics on this call? I'm really curious to know. Um, lizards, snakes, spiders. Ah. Okay, a couple. Awesome. So this is a really great thing to have printed on your window. 
Another really key thing to have for your pets is a pet first aid kit and emergency preparedness kit. So Bark First Aid, my business, Bark stands for Backcountry Aid and Rescue Kit. So these are actually pet first aid kits and they work for humans too. So it kind of makes sense to have a first aid kit that works for both you and your animal. So consider maybe just taking a look at the QR code, maybe see if you like it, maybe an early, early Christmas gift for next year or a gift for yourself or your pet just cause, but uh, yeah, could not um, stress this enough. Having the supplies, including first aid supplies is so important at all times. So kind of just going back to what it would look like if we're evacuating um, and let's say you can't find pet friendly accommodation. Uh, in, in most cases, that is unfortunately how uh, hotels and boarding centers are. So something to consider ahead of time, where will we be leaving our animals if we don't have them with us? So once you've determined how you're gonna evacuate your pets, we wanna make sure that where they are is uh, safe and able in, until you're able to return home. So again, many human evacuation shelters do not allow pets. I think I needed to say that twice just so it really lands with folks. Cannot say how many times that's happened in the past where all the hotels are um, unfortunately saying no to pets unless they're service animals. So check with your community emergency management agency just regarding what sort of disaster shelter policies they may have. I won't be able to get too in depth with livestock on this conversation. It is a whole other realm of preparedness, but really the biggest take home tip for large animals, livestock, that sort of thing, is that you need to evacuate earlier, plan earlier, and pretty much everything that we've talked about already, uh, done so on a larger scale. Some people have dozens, if not more, per um, head of cattle or horses. So considering uh, just speaking with folks who have evacuated livestock, just how much more planning needs to go in ahead of time here. These are some interesting enclosures for exotics. Um, so depending on what they are, what their environment is and what they need, um, they may need some really specific things. And as a owner of an exotic animal, you probably know pretty good, better than most. So for birds, maybe an extra blanket to cover their carrier and a spray bottle to take care of their feathers. Uh, if you have a reptile, a sturdy bowl for your pet to soak in and something to warm it with. And in a last ditch effort, snakes can be transported in a pillowcase. It's not ideal, but it works in a pinch. I just want to have a couple take homes here. Um, please make sure to keep your pets inside during extreme weather. Animals are very sensitive to sudden changes in temperature and even like the barometric change and often isolate themselves when scared. During an emergency, we want to be sure we separate cats and dogs, uh, keep smaller pets such as hamsters away from larger animals. The stress can, you know, lead to unusual behavior and we just don't want any accidents. And it is easy to startle cats in the chaos of an evacuation. If you've ever even tried to bring your cat to the vet clinic, they can be master hiders. Um, so just make sure that we keep them safe in a crate or cage. All right. I sincerely appreciate you guys for tuning into this call. I know that there are a lot of animals sleeping at your feet right now that will benefit from this knowledge that you guys are taking in. Um, I really appreciate your patience with me as I struggled to get that slide going. I don't think I even got it right, Scott. So <laughs> I don't think it's on full screen. So guys, I'm so sorry, but uh, I thank you so much. The message behind what I'm um, getting through here is just that our pets are so deserving of proper preparation, consideration, and care. Um, and we really owe it to them to do what we can right now to make sure that they're safe. So I hope, I wish you guys all um, a safe summer. I hope that the evacuations uh, aren't going to affect us too much this year, but I do foresee them to affect quite a lot of us. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> Yay. Thanks, Celine. That was awesome. Can everyone give a clap if you haven't already? That was good. I think it's worth uh, clapping again. And uh, I see Scott has Jasper behind him now standing Hi. so still, but I think it's a picture. That's wonderful. And I assume the same thing. 
So Lynn, you just mentioned it. I bet you everyone who's here tonight has their pet near them, on their lap, beside them, on their shoulder, <laughs> cuddled up, they're cozy. And if anyone was taking any pictures tonight of the presentation, because they have in the past and, and uh, posting, we'd love to see your pets. We'd love to see who's sitting with you. Feel free to tag us along the way. We have some great questions, actually, for both Scott and Celine. So hopefully Scott and Celine are ready to roll. I'd like to start with Scott, actually. And uh, I had a question here from the audience. It was an anonymous question. They were wondering about the two weeks. They remember something about the 72 hours. Yeah. And we would love it if you could expand on that. Thank you. Sure. Um, federal government of the Canada and the U.S. many years ago sat down and thought, okay, looking across the entire countries, uh, what it would be a reasonable amount to try and get people to at least start thinking about doing an, uh, uh, emergency preparedness. And they came up with 72 hours. That's great. Uh, however, let's take a look at what's happened in the last few years here. We've had uh, a flood where they took out uh, Highway 1, Highway 3, and Highway 5. Uh, and that took, before we got a, a even basic truck service coming through, it was multiple days. It was beyond three days. Right? Uh, there were people who were cut off for months on Highway 8. Uh, we've had storms, wind storms, uh, that have taken out power uh, in places, and it's been over a week. Uh, you look at the ice storms that happened in Quebec, and those ice storms, people were in the, uh, trapped in their houses for two weeks. Uh, after an earthquake, you're right, within 72 hours, probably there will be the first responders who have landed via helicopter, but I don't know about you, but they're not coming to my house first. They're probably coming to a, a long-term care home or something else like that. The fire department and all those people who are local to us, uh, they have other priorities at that point in time. They have to make sure that uh, uh, very basic things, they understand what's happening at the hospital. They're not coming to visit you and giving you your water and such. So we want you to be prepared for two full weeks at home. And you know what? If that big thing hap happens and you do manage to get people within a week, you're good. But you're probably not going to be the first person that they're going to go knock on the door on. Thank you, Scott. This next question is for Celine. What type of vet documents would you suggest having copies of? Great question. <clears throat> I think in this day and age, it's really easy to get your pet's full medical record in one digital document. It's usually like a multi-page PDF. Um, but the biggest thing would be any sort of prescriptions. If your pet had any sort of uh, medication that was prescribed regularly, as well as their vaccine status. So what vaccines were given when and when they're due. And I didn't quite mention it on the uh, slide, but also deworming and external parasite control. So fleas and tick and that sort of thing. So that, you know, in the chaos of a situation, um, an emergency situation, you can look, okay, my pet is up to date. They have all their prescriptions here that I can just, you know, get to another veterinary clinic um, and also information with your name on it. Again, if you are separated from your pet, that is proof of ownership. I might actually just add one more thing here, Sandra, just uh, a third party consent form. So not many people, maybe give me a thumbs up if you guys already have one, but let's say if you go on vacation or if you're away, um, having a third party consent means that another person has authority over your animal in the event that something happens and you're not reachable. So yeah, if there was an injury or an emergency with your pet, it's almost like the the auntie or the uncle of your pet is, is there to legally uh, take care of them. This next question is for Scott. What's, oh, sorry, I missed it. Hang on, it moved. Where did it go? Oh, I want to keep what I need in a rat proof container. Can you recommend anything? Actually, I'll, 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 I'll give, uh, uh, if you're going to keep stuff at home, there's a number of places you can keep them. Um, one of the things to bear in mind is if you have like a single family dwelling and you're putting it outside and you want to put stuff outside, uh, sometimes they even have those big wheelie carts. If you're talking about your 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 stay at home thing, you have those big wheelie carts that you use for like garbage and stuff like that. You know what? If you have one of those and you have one of those that have like a lock on it, you put a lock on it. No one's going to think that it's anything other than garbage. And it's pretty. 
they're pretty good about keeping out uh, animals and such. Uh, still want to put it in your shed, but it, there wouldn't be a bad option. So it really depends on what you're looking at. Uh, maybe Celine uh, has some ideas. Um, <laughs> are you looking at me? Cause I got rats <laughs> <laughs> has rats and I'm not even going to deny it. We have rats. So I know the pain of, uh, this actually even happened to me last summer. I went to look at my old, um, grab and go bag that I had some ramen noodles, a couple chocolate bars, and it was completely shredded. So, um, yeah, I might not be the one to answer that because I did not rat proof my stuff, but any sort of container that's got a super solid locking, um, handle to it, like those Tupperwares that have like the handles that lock on top. Um, yeah, just the more structurally sound they are, the better. So Lynn, this one's for you. I'm pretty sure. This uh, question is about a dog that suffers from chronic pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. uh, their owner controls it through a vegan diet. Eating animal protein can be fatal. How do they make that known other than on their collar in case they're not there during the evacuation? Amazing question. And it was something in my head. I even was thinking during the presentation, I didn't mention it. Um, but exactly. What if your pet is blind? What if your pet has pancreatitis, uh, epilepsy? Um, so on that emergency rescue personnel, um, card to fill out to actually highlight, I have one dog and they have a medical condition. Um, if you have, you know, in the event that you leave your animal, at home, leaving their crate right at the front door. So it's impossible to miss with their records and their name and your name kind of duct taped to the top with a really highly visible sign, blind, epileptic, uh, potentially dog aggressive, you know, anything that might be specific to your pet. And again, talking about how stress can really exacerbate those things, pancreatitis can can be one of those. Uh, again, same with any sort of like urinary or kidney problems as well and, and seizures as well. Anything can, can be made worse with stress. Scott, we had someone ask about the youth emergency program. Can you give us the Coles notes version on that? If you don't mind. Sure. Uh, the Youth Emergency Preparedness Program was something that I designed for my local municipality when I lived up in North Vancouver. Uh, and it, it can be used by any municipality, uh, but ultimately it was designed to go into things like a Girl Guides uh, meeting or a Cub Scout meeting uh, and have a really uh, big fun evening of uh, two hours of running around like maniacs like you normally do as, uh, uh, as Cub Scouts and, and learning about emergency preparedness. Thank you. So Lynn, what are the best training skills we can start to work on with our dogs? For example, this, this caller, this caller, this guest routinely practices extended downs, under ups, overs, and middle, but what would some other training ideas be that would be useful? Great question. I would say restraint and transportation, actually lifting your pet, carrying, like you saw that girl with the dog kind of slung around her neck. Um, any sort of recall, like come back, get here now type command. When you, when you say it and you mean it, uh, you, you really hope that your dog knows how to respond. But I would say the biggest thing is any sort of touch handling. Um, some pets can be really touch sensitive to their paws, their ears, strangers. Um, and so if let's say you have a firefighter coming to your house, completely cloaked up, you know, their face might not be visible, they're unfamiliar, they don't smell familiar, and they come in and that can be quite scary to an animal who doesn't really have a lot of confidence around strangers. Um, so working with your pet to be comfortable being handled by all sorts of people. And one thing I've also uh, really talked about a lot in my pet first aid courses is take your dog somewhere really exciting, um, really busy, let's say like the entrance to a Walmart store or a home hardware and just sit there and do nothing and just be okay with watching the world go by and not be frazzled at all the things buzzing around you because that's what you're really going to, that's going to be your ambient environment in an evacuation. There's going to be people everywhere, noises everywhere. So if you can practice just sitting there and hanging out and just observing, triple thumbs up. I wish I could do another one. That, <laughs> that's really my answer. Yeah. 
Well, that kind of speaks to our second T in our three T's. We talk a lot about trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. And you're talking about that training, which is also practice. And and we we ask outdoor enthusiasts to practice emergency rescue. Think of those what ifs. Practice at home with your gloves on, getting your avalanche transceiver out from underneath your coat and extending your probe and using, you know, we talk about practice. So those are, those are great points. So then I think another one for you before we move on to a short video and uh, some giveaways at the end here. Um, thoughts on soft sided crates for large dogs. This um, uh, guest here, her name's Stephanie. Uh, I feel like my girl could rip right out of one of those in a heartbeat <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but she never has tried, but thoughts around that, uh, that type of crate. Yeah. I mean, I totally hear you on that one. I have done, uh, so many, um, or I have been a foster to so many animals before I love fostering dogs and I've seen so many different types of crate anxiety and separation anxiety from those dogs. Um, so much so that those dogs I've seen chew through the super heavy duty, plastic or wire crates. Um, and yeah, so those can be, um, pretty much indestructible, but when you have a dog that really wants to get out, they're going to work really hard to get out. So again, this goes back to training desensitizing. So it's not a torturous, stressful thing when they're in there. It's just, it is what it is. Um, and working, uh, in a lar or having a larger crate. I think also I find animals tend to be comfortable in a smaller space, but if they feel like they're so stuck in there, they can't stand up, they can't turn around, um, they might be more agitated. So definitely a crate that you trust that won't break in one hour and bring along a second crate. If that's really a consideration, like, okay, my dog has the potential to destroy their crate, maybe bring another one just in case. <laughs> Good luck. Great points. And just one little point from me, before we move on to a short video and then we'll give away those prizes. I was talking to one of my coworkers the other day and she's also with a search and rescue group. And they actually, this first responder search and rescue uh, volunteers carry a muzzle with them. So if they're rescuing a subject, let's say they're a hiker and the hiker brought their dog along, search and rescue aren't really sure how those dogs might respond. So this, this, this group, the search and rescue group actually carries muzzles with them when they're heading out there and asks then the owner to place the muzzle on their dog so that the situation is supported and search and rescue are doing their best to make that a comfortable situation for everyone. Absolutely. And that's something we talked about in the pet first aid conversation, just how invaluable it is to desensitize your pet to a muzzle and to have one that fits. So maybe that's something that you could also, you know, leave behind or have a couple that you bring with you. Um, just in the event that it's a highly stressful environment, they're getting pulled out of somewhere um, the person handling the dog is not at risk of being bit. We'd like to show you a short video. We'll be back right after this. We do have some prizes to give away, and one of them is from Celine. So don't go away. We'll be right back. And thanks for joining us tonight. So, you want to be adventure smart. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, but but what is being adventure smart? Being adventure smart is really all about taking responsibility for your own safety and following the three T's. <laughs> Got it. Um, what are the three T's? What are the three T's? The three T's are the trifecta of outdoor safety, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. The three T's can vary from person to person, activity to activity, and season to season. But here are some important ways to ensure you are prepared and safe on your next adventure. Trip planning. We could go on forever about this one. Trip planning is an essential step and one of the easiest ways we can stay safe on our adventures. This is something that should be done every time we head into the outdoors, whether for a few hours or multiple days. Trip planning can be broken down into four simple steps. Planning your travel route and navigation is about picking a trail or route based on its difficulty that's relative to your experience, ability, and the amount of time you have. Know your limits. Not all trails are created equal, so know the terrain and conditions. A 10-kilometer hike scrambling straight up a steep mountain is a lot different than a 10-kilometer stroll around a lake. Before you go anywhere, check the weather and keep checking it as things can change 
fast. This includes wind, precipitation, temperature, and sunset times. Finally, make sure you leave a comprehensive trip plan with a trusted contact. Keep in mind, this may not be your mom or dad or best buddy. Choose someone you can count on if you were to get into trouble. A comprehensive trip plan might be as simple as sending your trusted contact a text or email with key information about your activity or using the Adventure Smart app, which allows you to enter a detailed trip plan. Training doesn't mean being an elite athlete or being queen of the mountain on Strava. Training is a continuous process of outdoor recreation. It's about developing the necessary skills and abilities to be safe. This might include working your way up to that big summit hike, taking a few courses to expand your wilderness and backcountry knowledge, navigation and route finding courses, or even learning more advanced skills like rescue and emergency training. You have planned and trained. Now make sure you take the essentials. Taking the essentials means packing everything you potentially need to stay warm, safe, and dry if an emergency unexpectedly arises. What if you rolled your ankle or got hurt? What if you got lost and had to spend the night outdoors? Take the time and be prepared to look after yourself. So that's it. Those are the three T's. That's it. <laughs> But no matter how hard you train, how well you trip plan, and how much essential gear you bring, you may still find yourself in an emergency. And that's okay. The wilderness can be unpredictable. If you find yourself in an emergency, it's important to stop, think, observe, and plan. Use that essential gear you brought to stay warm, dry, and safe, and contact 911 on your emergency communication device. Remember, search and rescue in BC is free for everyone. Remember, safety is an outcome of good trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. It's your responsibility. So let's all do our part and be adventure smart. Great. We have a few prizes to give away and let's get right to it. Thanks for joining us this evening. It's been a wonderful time with Scott and Celine. Thanks very much. The first giveaway will be a reflector from Reco. And that first question is, and just a little hint, the answers are were provided tonight in the webinar. So if you listen closely, took any notes from Scott or Celine, uh, you'll have the answers. Type quickly and we will go from there. Okay. This one here, how many days medication should you have in your human grab and go bag? It looks like there's a lot of people who've answered. There's a whole bunch of different answers there. So in a grab and go bag, I recommend a week's worth of uh, medication as a human, because you'll be able to get to a doctor and you'll be able to get to a pharmacist and get some more. Uh, it, when you're at home and you're hunkering down at home, you're going to need to have at least two weeks self-sufficient. So that's a different, that's for your hunker down at home plan. But we do have some people who answered seven days or one week. Perfect. Thank you. We'll organize the uh, winnings and we'll email you and put you in touch with the person who's giving out the prize. Awesome. The second question is for Light from Bright Source. This one is uh, from Celine's presentation. I thought it was quite interesting. How many liters of water should you have for your dog and your cat? We need two answers here. We need two numbers. How many liters do you need for your dog? How many liters do you need for your cat in this emergency evacuation? Per day. Per day. Yeah, that's a lot to card, isn't it? Wow, so we've got a lot awesome. of answers there. Celine, did, did you see one that's uh, at least one that's correct? I see lots. Good work. Okay, good. So tell us what it is, and then we'll make sure we get the first person get a uh, get a prize. Four liters for dogs, one liter for a cat per day. Wonderful. Last but not least, this is for a wonderful 26 item first aid kit from Celine. We're very grateful that she's uh, able to provide this. This is a pretty exciting uh, item to win. And I found this interesting that you mentioned because it ties into a lot of what we talk about in that practice and training. So the question is, when is a really good time to practice your emergency evacuation? 
this was a, oh, look at the answers there. Yes, that's a lot, of, a lot of participation, a lot of answers. Nighttime, nighttime struck me and, and it shouldn't have struck me because I'm always saying, you know, to practice with your gloves, practice in the house, practice outside, practice summer, winter, spring, fall, nighttime. Of course, there's a chance things will happen in the evening when it's dark, even maybe as the, after the, the sun has set. Wonderful, everyone. Thanks for playing. I'd like to go back and thank Scott personally. You do a lot for us. We really appreciate it. And tonight coming on as a guest was a bonus. Celine, you're welcome back anytime. A third time is a charm, maybe. Maybe that's a little invitation for summer. Who knows? Maybe I'll figure out uh, everything computer-wise before then. <laughs> Again, so sorry for that, but uh, no worries. at least we got through it. So thank you guys for your patience. We did. And thanks to everyone for joining us. This does help out the 3,400 volunteers and they do really appreciate it. We have one last webinar coming up on March 7th. If you found this one, you know how to find that one. Hopefully you can join us again. Enjoy the rest of your winter. Be safe. And thanks for getting informed with us tonight. Take care, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone.